Welcome to Night Colors Bigfoot Radio. It's February 3rd, 2019. You're here with your hosts, Lori Hood and Lauren Smith. How are you doing, Lori? I'm doing great. How are you? Fantastic. Enjoying this weather. It's a nice 60 degrees here in Oklahoma today. A little windy, but uh, uh, really gorgeous compared to the freezing temperatures we've been having. So um, not as bad as the Midwest up there, so I really just can't complain, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> no, negative thirty is nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's nothing <laughs> to to say boo hoo at because that is cold. That's some cold weather up there. Yeah. Of course, I was yeah. running around in shorts when they were up there shoveling five feet uh-huh. of snow, and uh, it's the way it is down here in Deep East Texas. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh... You know, they say, you know, southern weather, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. <laughs> I know. It's that way everywhere, though, down in the south. It sure is. They are saying that this month we are going to, we're, we're supposed to be having an outing, and and they're talking about it being a wet month. And I'm like, yeah. great, great. Uh, everybody good. bring your tarp. <laughs> bring your tarp, yeah, bring your firewood. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> my husband Dang, was asking it, about it would that. Just be he's, my like, luck. he's like, so um, is the outing going on no matter what the weather is? And I was like, oh, well, it's East Texas. I'm like, it doesn't really get that cold there, so we should be good. I didn't even think about the rain, this monsoon yeah. season round, you know, year round. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, most of these people are, are uh, seasoned researchers are used mm-hmm. to the rain or used to the cold and yeah. all of that and they come prepared for it so not too worried about it but yeah mm-hmm. you know we've had uh um well, let me tell you a little bit about out here real quick and then we're going to get to our guest but um we've been having a huge pack of coyotes moving through here three or four times a night very unusual uh being in the yard, as a matter mm-hmm. of fact. Now, I, I think that I was, was thinking that they were in the yard because they were so loud. Mm-hmm. But I, I've been jumping out there with a spotlight, and I can't see them, but mm-hmm. I can still hear them. And right. they're running around the perimeter of my property, and I'm like, mm-hmm. what is going on here? Well, I still haven't figured it out. But they'll come back two or three times. And I was mm-hmm. burning yesterday, and I thought, well, this smoke will keep them away. Didn't even slow them down. Mm-mm. So I've been real scared to let my dog out at night without supervision. And mm-hmm. <laughs> I just I worry, you know. So um, yeah. anyway, that's what's going on here. I did uh, record a very strange sound that I didn't get a chance to get uploaded. I want everyone to hear it. I know what it is. This is something new for me. I do know what the noise is, only because Mark told me what it was. <laughs> but I would have thought that it was a T-Rex when I heard it the very first time. Mm-hmm. But I'll I'll get it uploaded to the show. We'll play it next week, and you guys can hear what I hear. And it's just weird, weird, but I do know what it is. Okay, so... Do you have any news, or can we go ahead and go with Mr. Nope. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, tonight, everyone, we have uh, West Virginia Bigfoot researcher Russ Jones, and um, we're going to bring him on. He's been graciously waiting in the wings. So how are you doing tonight, Russ? Hey, Lauren. Hey, Lauren. How are y'all? Doing great. How are you? (laughs) Doing just fine. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Okay, now you were talking about the Super Bowl before we went on the air, and I just have to ask, uh, do you know who's winning? I know there's probably only five uh, minutes left. Seven minutes left, and New England just scored. So New Mm -hmm. England's winning 10 to 3. Okay. (laughs) Wow. 10 to 3, did you say? 10 to 3, and it's been a boring game. Oh my God! This got to... all of us watching for the commercials. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the update. 
<laughs> hey, you're welcome. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. You get me, it's a full service kind of thing. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We got our sport, you our know weather, what? our news. <laughs> I know. Can I pick them? Hey. <laughs> <Right. Anyway. laughs> welcome to the show, Russ. Um, hey, well, I appreciate uh, Russ, that. could you start... <laughs> Could you start us out and tell us how you kind of got involved with Bigfoot in the first place? You know, um, I had an experience uh, when I was younger, and so I'd always followed um, Bigfoot things. You know, I always read all the books, and I always, um, you know, watched the TV shows and that kind of stuff. But I had uh, went to Indiana, an undergraduate, for four years, and then I was in doctor school in Iowa for another four years and then I was busy and you know I hunted a little but I just didn't spend that much time in the woods and then about 10 years ago I went to Ohio Bigfoot Conference I didn't know anybody and uh, you know it was pretty interesting for a novice person that didn't have any experience with any of the Bigfooters because as you know you know Bigfooters can be you know a little different and uh I went there, and after that, I saw the BFRO had a Ohio expedition. And, you know, I grew up in Ohio. I, I live and practice in West Virginia, but I have a place in southeast Ohio as well, and that's where I'm at today. But um, so I went on that uh, expedition 10 years ago, and at that time, Matt Moneymaker still went on all the expeditions, and uh, Matt and I just hit it off, and I'd been involved with the group then and have done I don't know I put on a lot of expeditions for the BFRO and you know I spoke at the Ohio conference one year and um, two years ago I wrote a book called tracking the stone man and I'm in the process of uh, doing another book for the publisher now okay that's kind of what I'm Uh, up to wow wow so the stone man is that yeah. the Sasquatch or is that – oh, wow. Okay, yeah, so where know, did stone, that name come from, if you don't mind me asking? In West Virginia, there was five Indian tribes. Three of the five had names for Bigfoot, and Stone Man was one of them, and that just happened to be the one that I liked. So I chose that name, and um, it was funny. <clears throat> I had uh, I was seeing patients one day. And this patient uh, brought in this book, and it was called, like, Bigfoot in West Virginia or something like that. And he said, you know, have you ever heard of this? And I was like, no. And, you know, I had been publishing a lot of reports. And when I looked at this book, it was uh, this guy who was a university professor, but he had did an intro, and he did a closing. And the rest of his book, which was, like, 100 pages long, was just reports that I had did. And he had just copied my reports and put them in there. And I thought, this is crazy. I need to do my own thing. So I worked on it for – it took about a year to get it done. Uh, of course, when you're working with a publisher, it takes a lot of time. And, um, you know, but it turned out well, and I was happy with it. So how long did it take you to write the book? Oh, gosh. You know – what takes so long is, um, you know, they they give you a editor first, and I know that when I was done with the first editor, they said that we had exchanged 500 emails, and um, oh. so then they pass you on to someone else that knows um, a lot about Bigfoot, and Joe Bielart was my publisher, and he wrote the Oregon Bigfoot Highway, and um, uh-huh. and him and I exchanged a couple hundred emails after that just to get it done. I mean. At the end, you're just so sick of what you're writing that, you know, you just are done with it. And uh, I think about two months ago, it came out on Kindle uh, for the first time. Of course, it had just been in paperback for the last two years, and they switched it over to Kindle. And so I just read it again a couple months ago just to make sure there wasn't mistakes. And I enjoyed reading it again, but, you know, it took me two years to get where I could enjoy it again. Yeah. Lauren is having so, problems. Um, okay. Lauren, what are I'm you here? Now is... Okay. 
Lauren, are you here? All right. All right. I am sorry. <laughs> she is hey, it's she's just you texting and I. me. I know. It is you know, usually she's monitoring, but uh it shows she's here on the on the uh studio board, but uh she's not. So I I hope we're actually doing a show. I don't even know because she's the one that's uh, the host right now. So, well, anyway, let's get back to the show. We're going to have a great show anyway. So, okay. um, so uh, have you ever seen one? No, you know, I have not seen one. I have found tracks usually maybe two or three times a year I'll find tracks. I will um, hear wood knocks or, you know, find some kind of indication, find hair. Um, Probably about, I don't know how many times a year, but quite a few times. You know, I wrote in the book that, you know, I keep notes, and there were some scientists that were out in the Northwest that were biologists. And it looks like, uh, you know, my experience has been it takes about 200 hours in the woods to find any really good evidence. And when I've kept track mm-hmm. of it, you know, that's about right. And, and um, yesterday I'd heard uh, wood knocks here in southeast Ohio when I was out. And um, it had probably been about a month since I had heard anything. So have you ever had an experience where you felt like there was one close, like stalking you or in close, mm-hmm. like, uh, close enough for you to smell them or hear them? You know, I've... I've heard them and smelled them often. Um, the first time that I got, when I got really interested, I'd found I was rabbit hunting and I was coming around a hillside in a state park and there was a cave there. And when I came around that cave and it was New Year's Day and it was cold, but it was really sunny. And um, I found footprints, you know, something had been in that cave weathering that storm. And when it heard wow. me coming with my dogs, it had left, and I found those fresh Bigfoot prints, and that's how I originally got interested in it. But, I mean, you know, most invariably, when you start talking to hunters, and, of course, I see so many patients, and I'm always asking, you know, outdoorsmen, you ever hear anything? Mm-hmm. You ever been in an experience where, you know, you felt like something was watching you? Um, you know, they they usually say, and that's just like yesterday, so... Usually one of the things, aside from writing the book, that I'm known for is my game cameras. And I have 27 Reconics game cameras in the woods. And they're from wow. the uh, mountains of West Virginia into southeast Ohio. And so usually two or three times a week, I'm either moving a camera, changing the batteries out, or, you know, doing something. So yesterday... I had been trying to get into this wilderness area in West Virginia, and it's the largest tract of wilderness in Ohio, and it was recommended to me by a forest ranger. And I tried to get in there this summer, but it was just too thick. And so now with all the snow and the freezing rain and, you know, the sleet and the cold weather, I could get in there. And so I went in there, and um, I put one camera up about, you know, you have to drive in this forest road that dead ends about seven miles, and I could see that no one had been in there the last two weeks because there was no one that had broken the snow until I came through. And when I put one of the cameras up and I started up the hollow, I was about a mile in, no trails, I'm just a mile into the woods. And usually I'm choosing an area based on um, looking at a topo map or Google Earth, you know, just where I think – um, as a remote area where things may cross. And um, so as soon as I had started up the hollow farther, I would heard a wood knock. It wasn't that far from me, and I was certain that that's what it was. And it was interesting. I heard maybe four or five of them yesterday. And my I have a one-year-old wow. lab that's with me all the time. And every time that it would knock, he would look. So, you know, he was interested in it, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, some researchers will say that game cameras are useless, that Sasquatch 
are too smart for them or something like that. Would you disagree with that? You know, listen, I mean, um, Cliff uh, Berrickman and I have talked about this at length, and every time I see Cliff, Uh him and I are always exchanging, you know, pictures that we get in the woods and different things like that. And the Chinese Zoo has did a study, and there's a couple other studies that are out right now. And the reality is even our quietest game cameras, which the Reconics are the quietest ones, uh, you know, when you test them, and the Chinese test them Mm -hmm. all too, but animals can still hear them. So now what I'm trying to do is I'm moving my cameras near areas which are naturally noisy, creeks, rivers, Uh roads, you know, just hoping that I can get lucky. I mean, let's face it, I mean, aside from the fact that um, they may or may not be able to hear the camera, there's so few of them that the odds of me getting within 50 feet of one just aren't that good. Uh Um, Even though I'm taking reports and, uh, you know, and people are calling in and telling me where they just saw one. And I show up there immediately. I mean, the reality is, you know, that they they move around a lot. And in West Virginia and in Southeast Ohio, there's, you know, I estimate, you know, there's about maybe a family group in each county. And you know, listen, if you've ever had rabbit dogs or coon hounds, I mean, it's hard to find your dog when you're close to it. I mean, let alone yeah. find something that, you know, is smart, wants similar, to you know, to a, yeah. a human and wants to be hidden. Um, so, you know, but another thing I think is that if we're not doing something to really try to get some evidence, then we're really in the woods just wanting to have an experience, you know, so I've already had enough experiences, you know, I'm really hoping that we can solve what's going on. So at present, you know, the best way I can do it is to try with all my cameras, which I keep buying another one every few months. And trying different things, trying different schemes, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, like maybe I'll change settings so that my cameras are just pulsing a picture. They take a picture, you know, every couple of minutes as opposed to uh, um, firing up to make a noise, which is what the animals hear. Um, Mm -hmm. Or like I said, you know, around the creeks or the roads, just hoping that, I mean, you're just really hoping you get lucky. I mean, that's that's right. That's right. Wow. And, you know, you you can't put them too close to where there's a lot of deer going through because, um, you know, deer just will kill your battery life. The reconnaissance cameras, I can get, usually some of them will last a year, and they'll have three or 4,000 pictures on them when I pick them up. And I tried to mm-hmm. leave all the cameras in place for four seasons, you know, because, like I said, I, I don't think that there's some areas they may stay in. You know, maybe they have a way of getting food in that area. Someone's feeding them like a habituator um, yeah. or something like that. But Or maybe that's the only place to stay and they just have to make it work. But in a lot of the places across the country, you know, I think that they move through the area, you know, following – weather or um, the food sources. So you do you ever leave anything out there to bait them or anything like that? You know, what I've been doing is um, I've been leaving curiosity type things. And sometimes mm-hmm. I'll leave them um, around cameras or sometimes I'll leave them just on stumps or um, rock uh, caves, entrances to coal mines, and um, different things that I'll leave are like uh, those little, I don't know what you call them, I call them like whirly gigs, those things, the things that the kids blow on and they spin. Oh, um, the spinners? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh no, well, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, the little plastic have, things that people put in their gardens that the wind blows them. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can buy those okay. bulk on Amazon. I usually carry those in my pack, and I have different colors of rocks, marbles of different colors, and I'll leave them in rock cliffs, rock overhangs, on stumps that are really apparent, and I'll take pictures of them. 
And uh, whenever I happen to be in that area again, I'll check and see whether or not, you know, they've been moved. I mean, just because they've been moved no, doesn't necessarily mean anything. But, um, you know, I mean, it's something to consider. Right. Okay, so I you mean, don't ever set the these cameras way. up for video or anything. It's just all pictures. Some of them I'm set up for video now um, just because I'm trying different mm -hmm. things. But the video tends to, um, you know, it's just like if you were using the ones that send text to your phone, you don't really, it wouldn't last very long. Um, mm -mm. So I'm not using anything like that. I'm using ones that I had to go to. And like right now I have three cameras that I haven't got to, well, in like a year and three months. And uh, there's a chance that they'll still be taking pictures, but you know, when you have so many cameras and some of them are up in the high mountains and when the snow comes in, you know, you're just, you can't mm -hmm. really get to them very easily. And, uh, you know, how do you remember where them. you put these cameras? I mean, you have <laughs> well, you know, everybody that many would out there. Ask, yeah, they ask me all the time if, uh, they'll say, do you, you know, do you Google them or you GPS them or whatever? But it's funny, you know, I, I don't have any problems remembering where they're at, but wow. sometimes, you know, I'll be putting one out in the winter and, um, you know, you have to really be careful in the winter because, you know, a lot of times you'll come back and there's, there'll be leaves and stuff right in front. You know, you have to really watch it if you're doing that. And then mm -hmm. when I come back, there'll be leaves on and the area looks completely different. And it may take me like 10 or 15 minutes to find exactly where it is or maybe it's the next hollow up um, because, you know, a lot of times I'm choosing um, – you know, like I like to get, if we have real rainy weather, which in West Virginia and Ohio this past year, it's been horribly rainy. You know, we had almost 70 inches. Um, so, you know, that's almost considered tropical. And I'll choose mm -hmm. a <laughs> creek that runs up a remote hollow and one that goes for several miles, and I'll just follow it, you know, just looking for tracks. And then if I find a, a place where several hollows come down the same place, you know, I put a camera out there so I know that I've blocked, um, you know, that particular area. And um, I'll have to, I also have to ask this. Have, have you had any problems with theft? You know, I've never lost a camera, but now that I say this, oh, you know, you're going so to jinx good. me. Well, I know but, it. Uh, Let's knock on wood. <laughs> about, uh, oh, my God. About Two months ago, I got to a place and I couldn't find one of my cameras. And, you know, I'm using a cable lock on them, but, I mean, they're not very hard to cut, if you know, if you have some type right. of cutting instrument. And uh, so I have one at present that I couldn't find, but I'm going to go back and look for it again when we have some snow on the ground because I'm hoping I just mm -hmm. overlooked it. Yeah. So, like I said, it's three miles huh. from the nearest road, so it's not on a trail because generally, you know, I'm not. I may use a trail to get to a remote location, but then I go off the trail. Um, so you know, I'm trying you're to trying find... to get physical evidence, such as a picture. And do you ever record or do any kind of audio recording while you're out there? No, I don't. Do you wear a GoPro while you're out there? Um, no, I don't wear. Uh, I don't carry a, a any type of audio recording at all. I have friends that do that. I know that uh, mm -hmm. some of them are really working on, you know, that's their deal. They have different schemes, but my whole deal yeah. is my cameras. And then in particular, I'm really interested in trying to find the beds, you know, and I found a couple different mm -hmm. beds um, in this past year. I got really interested when the Olympic project uh, found those beds. Um, I think it was a year before last. And so, you know, I just knew that if there was something like that on the West Coast, that they had to exist in some form on the East Coast. And so um, I've had some success finding them. At least now I know um, where to look for them, uh, in particular um, when our berries come ripe here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I look for right-of-ways where, they go through and in West Virginia and Southeast Ohio, we have a lot of rideways that four wheelers don't have access to they're remote. And, uh, if I can find a remote right away that has a, uh, North facing hillside close to it, then I'll go and find that, uh, you know, I usually look for that on Google earth and then I'll go there and then I'll walk 
starting in the creek bottom, I'll walk the flats back and forth on the hillside to see if I can find anything. But I found that they're usually not in the main hollow. They're usually in a side hollow. And then, like I said, it'll be on a north-facing one. And if I can find it close to a um, right away where the berries are, you know, then, you know, maybe you can find something. But, you know, like I said, it's it's not like you find evidence every time you're going in the woods. Most of the time you're just going in for a hike and, you know, you're just getting your time exactly. in the woods, and that's nice. What about formations? Do you put much stock in tree formations? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I understand that the great apes, the large primates, do it so it makes sense to me that bigfoot would do it as well but i'm frustrated by um not only like the woo or the uh, the paranormal side of things that are out Mm -hmm. there so much in bigfoot land now and i'm also frustrated by the stick structure i mean the internet is full of garbage it's full of people that are doing nothing but just walking out there and looking for sticks laying up against each other um you know that's not evidence by itself yeah um you know so what what do you think it would take to to be evidence so what what kind of formation out there would convince you or not convince you but because it's hard for anything to be completely convincing. But um, something that would really get you wondering if it wasn't a Sasquatch formation, what kind of formations do you look for? You know, I'd find, like, um, the things I find most compelling, if if you don't have an actual sighting or you find hair or tracks or get a picture, the things I find most compelling are um, twists, and trees um you know i can talk a little bit about there's this um thing that i started i guess i'm the one that kind of came up with it it's called a perch and um what a perch is is i found that bigfoot are curious and so they're interested in um going where people are if they can watch them from a safe distance and in particular, if it's an area like a state park, if it's long a lake, a dead-end place where maybe there's a dumpster or a trash can and people go there and fish and stuff at night and they throw their food and stuff in there, um, places like that or maybe um, over top of schools or something like that. And so a lot of times when the weather's warmer, I'll look for those type of places on a map and then I'll go and look and see whether or not I can find things. And a lot of times I'll find, um, you know, say 80 or 100 yards slightly uphill where there's a view of that trash can or that parking area. You know, I'll find a place where something has been standing. Um, A Mm -hmm. lot of times there'll be rock stacks there where something's piled up rocks or a lot of the tree branches are, broke not even like the huge ones but just like the little ones like something's just playing while it's standing there watching and um so i find that type of thing compelling i've seen some tree twists that i find compelling i don't find all this stuff where the trees are laying up against each other compelling i call it in west virginia we call that litter tree litter and um i know in the Pacific Pacific Northwest, um, Joe Bielart, which once again wrote the Oregon Bigfoot Highway, he said that he believed about one branch laying down in a million meant something. Hmm. Well, um, oh, my goodness, I, I just went blank for a second. Give me a second here. Um I can tell you a little bit about what I'm working on now for the uh, publisher. Please, please. I, when I think of that question again, I'll get back with you on it. Yes, okay. go ahead. The, um, I had, uh, of course, concentrated the one on um, Bigfoot in West Virginia, but 
I talked about treat foods, which is another thing that I came up with is that, like, I don't think it's helpful for us when we're looking for Bigfoot to say that, you know, they're going to be around deer because usually in most of the states where I'm at in the Appalachian Mountains, there's a lot of deer everywhere. So Mm -hmm. that's their primary food source probably in the winter between that and maybe some roadkill or, you know, maybe some dumpster diving if they're near enough that they can do some of that. But, you know, I think that they have a sense for they like the foods that they don't have readily available, and I call that treat foods. So when I go into an area, I'm looking for food that they wouldn't have any other time of the year, like it may be the fall when apple orchards are producing. And so I'm looking for orchards that are near. It might be berries in the summer. It might be gardens. You know, it just depends on that type of year, time of year, what it is. Um, so I talk about that, and I talk about the um, the perch. You know, those are the two things that I look for when I go into an area. And then I talk about, of course, just the normal reports that I get in West Virginia and some of the best ones I've had in my interviews with those people and some of the prank ones, the fake ones that people have done. And so the mm-hmm. publisher asked me to do um, look at other states in Appalachia and do whatever I considered to be the five best states in Appalachia. And so that's what I'm working on now. I'm going to each month I go to a different state and – I'm interviewing whichever historically has been the best Bigfoot witness in that state, that whatever was the sighting mm-hmm. that was the best one. I'm interviewing the whatever is the most renowned researcher for that state, and then I'm spending a day in whatever the best woods are in that state and a night in whatever the best woods are in that state. And so then I'm doing that for five states through Appalachia. And, so you're uh, going to write a book on this or a report? Yeah. No. Yeah, I'm going to write a okay. book on it. Um, and so probably by, I'm hoping by maybe next summer that it will be wrapped up. I mean, like I told you before, you know, you, it it, uh, it takes a long time to get it written, but, geez, it's, it's equally as long just between getting it written and, and uh, getting your publisher yeah, to get it exactly. out the door. <laughs> so that's... Well, uh, um, when it comes to witnesses, and you probably interviewed quite a few witnesses, is this true? Yeah. Yeah, I did 200 witnesses uh, before I wrote the book. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, that's a lot of people to talk to. Uh, what do you look for in truth? You know, if, if you're interviewing somebody, do you have, like, a little clues that tell you this person might not be telling the truth? Do you have anything that comes up like that? Yeah, I think um, I think most of the time most of us know uh, whether or not someone's telling the truth or whether they're not. I mean, I think it's interesting when um, you know, you'll hear police say or witnesses say, well, you know, eyewitness testimony is is notoriously poor. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the thing that's about that, though, and my friend Tom Wilson, that's a Bigfoot author, you know, he has talked about this at length, but this is what I find that's so interesting. Let's say that someone breaks into a bank and they run outside, and you got six people that saw him run outside, and one woman says, you know, hey, it's, the guy had blonde hair and he was three feet tall, and someone else says, no, he was he was green and he was eight feet tall. And you'll have all these different descriptions. But one thing that they all have in common is that none of them had problems saying that it was a human. Now, they may mm-hmm. disagree on the color of hair and the height, but they didn't have any problem knowing it was a human. And that's what I find about the Bigfoot people. You know, Bigfoot people, generally most of the witnesses know the difference between a bear and a person. So I think that while some people are getting it confused, maybe even the majority of the people, you know, it only takes one witness to have gotten it right out of the literally tens of thousands of reports, and there's a new animal. That's right. So, That's right. Um, 
you know, uh, maybe it's easier if you're a professional like a doctor or a lawyer or a social worker or, you know, a cop that uh, deals with people for a living. And so, you know, maybe you're a little more perceptive of whether or not something's real or not real. Um, but um, I think that it's kind of like, um, you know, I'm a chiropractor, and so um, I do back and oh, neck pain and headaches all day. And so uh-huh. when someone comes in, you know, when they want to tell me about uh, how they feel, well, if it doesn't make sense, it really is apparent to me because I just do it all day. Um mm-hmm. And I have for years and years and years. And it's the same way with Bigfooting. You know, there may be outliers or things that don't quite make sense in a report. But in general, most of us know what to expect out of, you know, the behavior of a Bigfoot and how they act. Um, You know, when the TV show was popular, um, you know, they did two episodes in West Virginia, and I think two in Ohio, if I remember right. And, of course, I, I helped with all those episodes in West Virginia. That's where, you know, I told them where to go, and I took the witnesses for them. And at that point, there was some great witnesses that, you know, they were hesitant to even go on the show because, um, you know, they just didn't want that kind of attention. Like, you know, two different yes. cops. Yes. And one was a uh, school teacher. And... um but then you had some people that, you know, they wanted to be on that show. That show was pretty popular. And when, when it started, it had almost mm-hmm. 2 million viewers. And um, and I remember, you know, that there was a couple times that um, I was pretty interested and I was pretty compelled when someone called me or when they submitted a report. But, you know, by the time you went down and you actually talked to them, then it was pretty apparent that um, – you know, that they weren't telling the truth because, you know, you go to an area and, you know, say in Southeast Ohio or in West Virginia, well, a Bigfoot could be anywhere. I mean, every place is good. And so when Mm -hmm. you go in there, you're saying, you know, why would that animal be here as opposed to someplace else? And, you know, if you look around and they have a lot of motion lights and there's a bunch of dogs and, you know, there's um, dust to dawn lights, well, you know, the odds decrease that something might be there. Um, you know, so it's just putting it all together. Well, you know, I've had that happen to me twice. Went to two different areas, and um, both areas, I could not find any evidence whatsoever that Sasquatch would be there or why they would even be there. Uh, one was in a neighborhood and the other one was down in South Texas. There were no trees. There, there wasn't any kind of cover. It was open, open. It was real close to a major highway. It, and I could find no evidence whatsoever. Yet, <laughs> a year later, on the one in South Texas, they came up with a hair sample that tested as unknown primate. And then on the other place, uh, Chris Noel got some plur image at this other place. So I'm mm-hmm. like, well, you know, you just never know. You just never know. It may, you know, I'm not the best, most top notch researcher out there, but I, I did give it a thorough looking over and could not find any evidence or even could understand why one would be in either one of these areas. Um, right. It, it was it, un, it didn't seem like there was any way for them to get in and out without crossing major highways and but yet they were there apparently right so well, well you know they show up in uh, uh Caroline Curtis which is the the secretary for the uh BFRO uh she calls that a SUO a Sasquatch of unknown origin Mm-hmm. You know, joking about it. You know, meaning that yeah, yeah, they'll show they'll show up almost anywhere, <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. you know, you know, sometimes not in places that we would expect to see them. I know that uh, exactly. here recently, I was talking with some of the other investigators, and we were talking about how close sometimes they are to very, very populated areas, and uh, you know how it, how 
you know, shocking it is that, you know, they would be in those places. But um, Exactly. Especially you know, neighborhoods. And, and, I mean, they have to pass numerous houses to get to this individual's house. I just could not. Right. It just, I, I just wasn't buying it at all. It just, that I was wrong. Apparently, I was wrong. Given enough time, they did get some kind of evidence, and I, I'm just felt it's like awesome. I had overloaded my mouth. Yeah, like I was so sure that they were not correct, and <laughs> apparently they were. So, how about one of the things that? I've always struggled with is that, you know, like I'm a outdoorsman. You know, and a, I'm a master gardener and a master naturalist, and I'm a hunter, and I have been my whole life. And, um, you know, so one of the things I've always concentrated on is um, knowing how wildlife moves and what area would be natural funnels and that type of things. But, you know, after so many years of uh, not getting something on my camera, you know, it makes me reevaluate how these animals move and thinking that they don't look at the terrain um, the same as the other animals do. And, uh, mm-hmm. of course, it's hard to know because, once again, you know, you might be in the right area, but, you know, you got to be within 50 feet of one. And, um, you know, so that's, uh, you know, it's just something I think that it, it's interesting. So, like, now sometimes I'm trying to find rock faces or cliffs with maybe a creek that can't be passed or a river and I'm trying to, like, block off whole hillsides. Um, sometimes I'm blocking off um, sides of mountains or hills where you wouldn't think that wildlife would come down. But, like I said, I've already done funnels and saddles and points and ridges and flats. And so now, you know, you're trying to not get so locked into how you look at things and be open to trying to come up with new ideas and pushing the envelope all the time. Um, You know, just trying to get, you know, some type of evidence. I mean, I just don't, it's fun when we all go out several times a year and we lead people or we, uh, you know, we go with our friends and we camp someplace and we all go in the woods at night and we all got our red lights and we all, sit on trees and we make noises and all this other stuff and sometimes we hear stuff Mm -hmm. but you know we're really not accumulating any evidence i mean at at best the very best thing that happens is maybe you get a track or something but you know once again i mean it's not like um well well, it's more about the experience at that point yeah yeah, it is. It's it's, it's about an experience. Yeah, at that and, point. You know, and that's yeah. how a lot of people get involved in Bigfoot stuff is, uh, you know, I mean, I've led. One time when I was doing a group in the mountains of West Virginia, I had a group, a bachelor party that was from Washington, D.C. that was there. And, um, you know, there's just all different kinds of people that are interested, no different than, you know, why I was interested in it. I mean, most of the people that are there, not most, but probably half of had some type of experience outdoors that they just, you know, they're curious about. And if you've spent time in nature and time in the woods and you've had an experience that you couldn't explain, you know, it it comes back on your mind and you think about it. It it makes you, um, at least it makes me want to, you know, know what it was or understand. uh, Exactly. You know, like. Exactly. uh, Have you ever had a. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say yesterday I heard that. You know, there's maybe an inch or two left of snow on the ground, and I heard that wood knock, and I didn't think it was that far from me. And, you know, sometimes sound carries a little funny in the woods, but mm-hmm. so I walked toward it, and, uh, you know, there was uh, two hollows that came down, and I stepped into the right hollow and put a um, camera up. And when I was doing that, then I could hear, I heard a wood knock, and like I said, it was close, maybe within a couple hundred yards of me. Um, up the hill from me and I said you know like I said my dog looked as soon as it made the noise and um, you know but it seemed like I should have been close enough that I should have saw tracks but I just didn't see any Mm -hmm. and um, but at that point I was probably two miles from where I parked off trail and 
you know, it takes a while, a while to get out of there, too. So, yeah, you know, still briars and everything else, you know, because you're choosing areas. I mean, generally where, you know, in my mind, you know, I think that they have safe spots that are places probably uphill, you know, if there's hills, that uh, people generally don't go or very, very seldom ever go. And that's the places where when they're in an area, that's where they're staying. Um, you know, like this area I was in yesterday, there was all these clear cuts. And the clear cuts are about anywhere between 7 and 25 years old. And some of them are going literally for hundreds and hundreds of acres, uh, maybe thousands. And, um, you know, when you're walking up these hollows and on the top of each hill, you have um, – these clear cuts, I mean, they're very, they should be loaded with deer. And when you're going through there in the beginning, maybe for the first mile, you're seeing deer tracks, deer track and deer track and all these paths. And you get up in these hollows farther and there's still that right away and there should be deer in there, but, and, or the clear cuts. But, you know, I get suspicious when I get to a point where it looks good and there's plenty of food for deer, but all of a sudden I stop seeing deer sign. And I'm up in there far enough that I think that a person wouldn't go, you know, then I think that I'm in an area where they're likely staying. And, wow, um, that is interesting. Yes. You know, so, you know, that's when what I'm considering when I'm walking up those hollows. And uh, like I said, yesterday I got up there and I noticed the, ho- the top of the mountain on my left had – uh, pine trees planted very closely, maybe 20 years old. And I thought, man, what a nice place with the cold weather and the wind and the snow to stay out of it. You know, you just, you'd be able to stay in there and stay a little warmer. And, um, you know, I put a camera up with a point coming down in a hollow right there. And like I said, as soon as I put that first camera up and started up the longer hollow, then boom, I heard that wood knock. And um, so that's what the kind of things, you know, that, that I think that I'm I'm looking for is things that in nature don't make sense. Um, you know, if I would have, uh, I just think that we just have to go farther. We have to go to places where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we wouldn't want to be disturbed. Um, if you know, if we were out uh, trying to avoid people, um, you know, where would we go to? Exactly. You know, there is a lot of wilderness still. It seems like, man, it's taking over everything and encroaching upon wild habitat. But, you know, there's still a lot of places where people don't go. You know, and there's never been fewer people in the woods. Um, You know, I saw an article in uh, the Charlotte newspaper talking about that, you know, in our lifetimes – we have fewer people in the woods. People are afraid of the dark. They're afraid of getting lost. They're afraid of the animals that are there. They're afraid of the snakes that are there. And people they've read are busy David with their Pilates lives. book. Yeah, they've read <laughs> David's book. And, yeah. uh, you know, listen, it wasn't until David's books I even started carrying a weapon. Prior to that, I never even carried anything. <laughs> But I think, you know, he, Dave made all this a little paranoid. Yeah, yeah. But, you but, know, I'm, you know, really I'm in the woods a lot. about that. I thought there was more people out in the woods now than, but I guess there is less. Because back 100 years ago, people were hunting for their dinner. And there's That's a lot right. less of that. You know, uh, people now go to stores a lot easier. Well, you know, listen, there was a... Um, study in Pennsylvania, they put a, a thousand, um, gave GPS trackers to hunters, and they found out that less than 1% ever venture more than a quarter mile from the nearest road or trail. And when I talk to groups or talk to people, and they'll say, well, it just seems like, you know, if there was something that somebody would have found, I, I keep wondering, it. like, yeah. who, who is somebody? Because I'm in the woods and I don't see anybody. Um, and so the reality is that even the, largely the Bigfoot people, you know, they're still on trails. They're still not that far from the nearest road. I mean, it's just unusual for people to go 
back in the woods. I mean, if you consider the most remote areas in Ohio or West Virginia, all through Appalachia, you know, maybe mushroom hunters, squirrel hunters, you know, maybe, um, I'm trying to think, maybe ginseng hunters. I mean, they may be. Or marijuana farmers or or meth Yeah, marijuana farmers. (laughs) They may go through the remote areas occasionally, but generally, um, people just aren't out there. Um, and I think that that's where largely these animals are staying. They're back there. And Mm -hmm. then when it gets close to dark, they move closer up to where, you know, there's deer at, there's trash cans at, things like that. I'll tell you another place that's really interesting that I've been finding some evidence at in both Ohio and West Virginia is a lot of times if you can find a park and there's a shooting range there, that they'll be very, very close to if there's a nice wilderness area and behind there are several thousand acres. People are nervous about going in the woods around those areas where people shoot, and they'll avoid those woods and those trails. And I have found a lot of evidence in those places. I found beds and I found some hair in those places. And I think that when it gets close to dark that they come down there and go through those trash cans where those people have been shooting and hunting and eating their McDonald's while they're doing it. Wow. That is interesting. So that's one of the things that I'll look for, uh, you know, in a park, too. Aside from that, like I was telling you, that perch area that, you know, if if I find a remote trash can or dumpster or something like that, then, you know, I'll just get out and I'll look and I'll say, well, if I was going to come to this dumpster, if I was going to watch these people, you know, where would I be at? You know, and if you look around, you'll find some place that you'll say, I'd probably hide right up there. And, you know, if it's in a remote area and something can come from a remote area to that spot, you know, sometimes you can go up there and you can find some kind of evidence where something has been at. But Another you know, unusual place in the, in the that summer. I've heard about. Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I walked down them in the summer because inter- usually, oh, you did, and that's okay, honey. Um, it's usually okay. in the summer you'll find them just because people aren't out that much in winter. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, you well, know, you I know, think that you they really the, withdraw. See, winter is the big, big time to research down here in East Texas. It's during the summertime, it's so hot. It is so hot. The mosquitoes, the ticks are horrible, and uh, it, it's just really not a good time. Um, and, and then I guess up north, summer is the better time. So, um, but anyway, what I was going to say, well, damn, I can't remember now. But go ahead, <laughs> and, and I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I oh, guess I need okay. more water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I, what, I, what I was going to I do remember now Graveyards I have heard yeah. so many stories Of people having experiences At graveyards that aren't ghostly In nature, but that are Bigfoot in nature Particularly these old rural Graveyards that are down Either on top of the hill or near Creeks And mm-hmm. uh, they'll go there to In in some of the cases, they went there for ghostly stuff and ended up with Sasquatch stuff going on. And um, so I don't know the reason why for this. Uh, I can't imagine there's anything in that graveyard that would interest a Sasquatch. But perhaps... Well, you know... uh, uh, Go ahead. Well, what what I would say is... is Yeah, the uh, well, you know, graveyards are, in deer hunting, what we call their edges. And mm-hmm. that that means that they're, uh, the grass that's there, the weeds that are there are different than in the woods that are surrounding it. And so oh. many times you'll see deer along those edges. And so a lot of times I think that they're there because that's where their prey is. That um, is the you know, best answer as, I've ever heard. And same way with the right-of-ways. You know, of course, here they'll use right-of-ways to travel, you know, because they avoid houses largely and they they go for long, straight mm-hmm. distances. And I think that they'll use those at night and then 
during the day they're off to the side of them maybe if they're moving along that they you know they'll be off to the side anyways and um then when they come to those right aways that's an edge to a natural place where deer go to graze and that type of thing. And so a lot of their prey is there. And I think that's the same way with the graveyards as well. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you hear a lot of reports, of mm-hmm. course, you know, which Bigfoot mm-hmm. group hadn't went and sat at a graveyard, you know, mm-hmm. and listened or whatever. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, we have about four minutes left. Uh, can you tell us how we can find your book, Tracking the Stone Man, and also when we should start looking for your next book? Well, you can find it on Amazon, uh, Tracking the Stone Man. Um, you know, people are welcome to look me up on Facebook. You can put in Russ Jones, Dunbar, West Virginia, and that will come up. Um, I'm also on Twitter, and on Twitter I do nothing but strictly Bigfoot stuff. And um, it's Bigfoot Doc. And so it's Bigfoot underscore Doc. And, uh, you know, you can follow Shade, which is my lab that's in the woods with me all the time. And you can follow uh, his and my adventures through the wilderness of Ohio and West Virginia. And uh, a lot of our pictures I'll post on there of interesting things that I see. Um, You know, sometimes it's bear and sometimes it's bobcats or whatever it happens to be that, you know, I run into in the woods. And, um, but, you know, listen, it's, if nothing else, it's, it's some of my best friends are involved and it's good to be in the woods. It's good for our mental mm-hmm. health. It's good for us physically. And, yeah. uh, you know, and I try to do good it all the time. Everything. Yes, I know. I, I love it. I love it. Well, and, you know, my patients you so know much. that uh, they're going to have to see one of my younger doctors if somebody has uh-huh. a sighting or if there's somebody that uh, has a footprint because they know that Dr. Jones is leaving the room as soon as that first call comes in. <laughs> you know, uh, we can we can thank Finding Bigfoot for that. People have become mm-hmm. so much more open-minded. I've been in this nearly 20 years, and uh, when I first got into it, uh, well, actually, yeah, almost 20 years, uh, when I first got into it, it was like everyone thought I needed that I was certifiable, and now it's everyone is curious about it. They they've become mm-hmm. familiar with it because of Finding Bigfoot. So you know we we owe a lot to that show. We absolutely do because it made things easier. People are actually uh, more comfortable about coming forward now um, right. because of that show. Uh, yeah, uh, probably some very old reports. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that show did for us too is prior to the show, most of the people didn't even know that Bigfoot made sounds. I mean, uh, really? you know, they'd have maybe a sighting or whatever, but that was the big thing that we got. Most of the reports was that the sounds, the noises. Now, I'm not saying that uh, you know people know the sounds of all the animals in the woods, but you know, I think mm-hmm. it was the first time that people got familiar with wood knocks and screams and roars and different sounds like that. And I know that I've had several different park rangers tell me when I talk to them uh, about the wood knocks. They'll say, I've heard that before. Yeah. You know, I tell you what, uh, I, I can't one... go to a public campground that there isn't some group of kids doing Bigfoot calls. Uh, well, isn't that I mean, period? I hear that all the time. I know. It's like everybody watches the show. And, yeah, yeah, I'm like, ah, that's in the, you know, that's in the camp. Well, we just need to just stay here and see what shows up. You know, that's oh, probably goodness. the best place, isn't it? How many times have we all been out and <laughs> nothing happens in the woods and everything happens around the campground? Exactly, especially when you've got uh, teenage girls can really do that high shrill, and I'm like, wow, you know, we'll just stay here and let them bring the people, bring them in, you know, bring the crickets in. Wow. Right. Russ, you have been an excellent guest. I have really, really enjoyed talking with you. I've actually learned from you. 
I have actually well, learned you. quite I'm a bit from you, and I appreciate that. Yes, yes. You know, most of the time when I have people on the show, I learn a lot from them from their own experiences and things like that, but I don't actually learn um, – well, I guess, I guess I learn from everyone, so I can't say that. But I've been particularly informed on this show, and I thank you so much. Well, you're uh, welcome. Will you, uh, you guys have me. In. Will you think about coming back when you get that second book ready to come out? I sure will, and uh, and hopefully I'm going to get some uh, awesome picture of one on one of my game cameras soon, and everybody's going to want to talk about yeah. it. Oh, yeah, everybody's going to want to talk to you then. <laughs> yes, yes. They'll be wanting to know how to get their own picture. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you have good luck with that. I do. I would like to think that the naysayers on game cameras might be wrong, you know, and that you get you get that million-dollar shot, you know, that money shot. Well, well, if I can get I one, guess I can better. get more than one. Yes, yes. Well, I hope you get video. That would even be more excellent, you know. Yeah, it would. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, anyway, we better call it a night. We're streaming now. We've already gone off the air. So I um, want to let everyone know uh, that next week we'll have Jack Carey from South Dakota. And uh, we'll be back here next Sunday night, same time, same station. And, uh, Russ, thank you again for coming on, and we'll see you next time. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Lori. Everyone, you're you're welcome. All right. Uh, Well, good night, everyone. All right. Good night. 